All right, uh, how's it going? Sorry, I've kind of lost my voice, so if you can't hear me, shout. Um, yeah, so pretty happy to be here in Portland. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a fun conference so far. Um, it's way more of you here than I thought would show up, so um, that's going to make the interactive part of the second half a little bit more interesting. Um, so yeah, I guess the way I'm going to do this is sort of the, the first uh, 45 minutes or 30, 45 minutes I'm going to do sort of a presentation. Um, and then because I accidentally signed up for the long form session, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to go a little bit more interactive, maybe uh, do some uh, either live coding or maybe I can get you set up uh, with some of the stuff I show you in uh, I don't know, I guess it really depends on what you guys want to see at your conference, um, but I would love to get you guys playing around with some computer vision stuff uh, afterwards. Um, but there's a lot of you, so I guess we'll wing that and do it live. Um, so for the first part, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about what computer vision is. Um, and then uh, I, my, my sort of connection to this is that I wrote some uh, bindings to OpenCV, uh, which is a computer vision library I'll talk about later. Uh, for, for Node.js, so that, that's the JavaScript um, and the robots that are in the official open source bridge title um, aren't here today. Um, I'll talk about that in a bit, but um, rather than that I'm going to look in depth at a specific uh, computer vision algorithm, how it actually works behind the scenes, just to sort of give some insight into uh, again asking sort of the question what computer vision is and uh, what, can we, what can we do with it. So, um, yeah, computer vision. Um, it's, uh, it's actually not a new field, it's pretty old, um, mature. Um, so for example, almost every manufacturing line in the, on the planet uses computer vision for quality control, uh, just as part of its you know, assembly line. Um, uh, so there are a lot of applications in industry, um, and I think there's a lot of applications in sort of the more fun stuff that we might be wanting to, to play with that we maybe haven't seen yet. Um, so I, sh I should probably start off by defining what computer vision is. And that's an interesting question. So what is vision? Um, and when I was uh, writing this, I was reminded of uh, this, the, the question, what is intelligence, that was asked to Alan Turing in his rhetorical response, <laughs> well, what is an intelligence? And I think that there's a very similar link between the, 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 the two topics here. What is intelligence? What is vision? Because vision is not sight. Sight is one of the senses, but vision is more than that. It's about how we perceive, how we interpret the sight. So today we already have cameras that can outperform the human eye, but they don't have vision. They just take what is around them and store that. There's no interpretation of that. Uh, and this is sort of compounded by the fact that computers don't do any thought process. They literally process data, and they process data in a way that we specify. So I really like this picture from, this is from O'Reilly's OpenCV book. Um, and it sort of breaks down the difference between what we see as a car based on our experience and, uh, you know, our day-to-day -day experiences of a car and the, the fact that a, a computer, all it literally takes in is the, the, the matrix of pixels. Um, and working with this, there's a lot less car to it. <laughs> um, not really more you can say about that, but this is sort of uh, an example of the way that we have a, a layer of perception on top of the, the raw data that it's coming in from our eyes. So in some ways, and maybe I'm stretching the, the metaphor a little bit here, but in some ways computer vision is a little bit like artificial intelligence in that what we're doing is defining vision in terms of how we as humans uh, perform. So as artificial intelligence is defined in terms of how humans think, we're basically modeling vision in terms of what happens subconsciously in our visual cor cortex. And in a certain sense, computer vision therefore is picking algorithms that model the way that we, th we, we think uh, about vision. So, 
OpenCV. That was a pretty vague definition of computer vision. Uh, so bringing us back to actually something concrete, OpenCV is sort of the library uh, for computer vision, um, or an open library, I guess. Uh, there's probably a lot of closed source ones that I don't even know about. Uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty old. Um, OpenCV was started in 1999 um, uh, by Intel. Are they the guys that sponsor downstairs? Okay, shout out to them then. Um, so they basically wanted to push computer vision forward uh, so they could capitalize off of the extra CPU cycles. Uh, or probably less cynically, there they wanted to, to push the state of the art forward by releasing a standard toolkit for computer vision that sort of lets us, um, lets us define common operations. Um, and over the time, it's grown into an absolutely huge library. Um, so I have a list of some of the things you can do with it. So there's face recognition, gesture recognition, sort of like the Xbox Connect, I guess, um, augmented reality, stereopsis, which is using two perspectives, two cameras, for example, and reconstructing a 3D environment from that. Um, and like I said earlier, because of the similarities with AI, uh, AI there's a machine learning component to uh, OpenCV as well. So my connection to this is I decided to make uh, bindings for Node.js. I don't, I don't know, I normally go to JavaScript conferences. This is probably way less friendly to JavaScript here. Um, <laughs> how many people are familiar with Node.js? Okay, how many people like JavaScript? Good, okay, we've got some friends here. Um, so basically, yeah, Node.js is a JavaScript um, execution, uh, JavaScript on the server, blah, blah, blah. But it's, um, it has the ability to interface to uh, C or C++ libraries, and uh, OpenCV is a C++ library. Um, well, well, some of it's C. It's actually, well, that's a more of a complicated definition. It's a, an old and organic library, let's say. So there are parts that are in C++, and there is a C interface to it, though. Yeah, anyway. Um, so I'd never written C++ before starting this project. Um, I guess I'm a little bit masochistic, um, but I thought, how hard can it be? It's just C with some classy stuff on top. Um, so there are bindings for OpenCV in Python, uh, which um, allows you to do computer vision in you know, a high level language. Um, and I guess that was kind of my inspiration for this is that I think that it's a lot of fun playing about with computer vision in a high level language because you, you don't have to worry about managing your own memory. It really gets you, lets you get your teeth into the the, the, the computer vision stuff without having to worry about, you know, compiling and whatever. Um, and oh, why not JavaScript, I guess? Um, yeah, not much more reason to it than that. Uh, so, how did I do this? Well, so Node is actually C++. It's built on top of the V8 engine, which is uh, the JavaScript engine. Um, and it has a very powerful way of writing extensions. So you can write code in C++ that will literally modify the JavaScript execution environment. Uh, we're actually going to look at some code in a second. Um, yes, V8. Uh, so here we go. Actually, rather than do this, I'm actually <coughs> just going to open it in the terminal. Uh, excuse me. All right. Is that big enough? Can everyone see? Okay. Let me take a seat because I can't see. So. Oh, we should probably look at the header file. So the basic data 
type in uh, OpenZB is the matrix, um, which is a multi-dimensional, uh, you can just think of it as a, you know, a matrix as in a, a two-dimensional array of pixels and each of those pixels is a different type depending on whether we're talking about a grayscale image or a color image or whatever. Um, but th so the basic data structure, I guess, is this matrix, and that means that most of the other operations that we're going to perform are performed on this, uh, th this data structure. So we're, this is the header file. Uh, this is too small. I'll uh, close this one for now. So this is, well, well, I wrapped this for uh, OpenCV, and so this is the actual header that, uh, for the, the wrapping. Uh, so this, do you see object wrap? This is the way that you wrap a C++ object into a JavaScript object that can be used within Node. So this is the actual matrix in OpenCV. Um, and then the way that you write these extensions is you define these uh, things for, like the constructor, for example, and then these are actually executed as JavaScript. Uh, so I'll show you the actual code here. Um, so, for example, let's look. Let's look at. So you can see it's quite verbose. Um, but this is so when you want to create a new matrix uh, in JavaScript, for example. This is actually what's run under the hood uh, as C++ code. Um, so it's, this isn't particularly interesting. I guess what I'm trying to get across here is that you have a huge amount of power in these bindings um, for what you can do within JavaScript. So for example, it's very verbose. You have to create a Boolean like this. Um, but anyway. Um, I don't really want to get too much into what's going on here. It was mainly just to show you what the OpenCV bindings look like. And maybe if you're interested, we can uh, take another look at them later on in the interactive part. Um, one of the things I thought might be interesting um, is if you were interested in seeing a specific OpenCV function implemented, I might be able to do that sort of as a live coding exercise to show you what the, the process of writing an uh, OpenCV, uh, a node binding, uh, was like. Anyway, um, so that was. So what does it look like in Node? So hopefully we can make it a little bit prettier than what we're looking at there in the, uh, the C++ code. So this is my sort of canonical example. Uh, what this code does here is it just constantly reads an image from the video capture zero is shorthand for the the first camera that's attached to the computer, which is generally the webcam. So on my my MacBook, it's the the webcam. Um, so this is reading an image from that, looking for faces within that, just logging out how many faces there are, and then doing the same thing again. Um, so yeah, there's not a whole lot to this. So let's actually try and do this live. This live demo. Uh, okay. Actually, let's let's take a look at the code first, just to prove that I, there's a little bit more to this code because we're actually gonna outline the faces. Uh, so yeah. As you can see, it's pretty much the same thing as I just showed you, but we actually draw the faces and then show them in a, a window. Uh, so I'm actually going to try this live, and <laughs> it normally works, but... All right, everyone, everyone say cheese. Oh, no. Oh, crap, that's a bad one. Um, two seconds. Man, I should have tested this beforehand. Oh, 
dear. Well, okay, so if we just imagine that that had worked, um, <laughs> I'll let this run. Um, so let's go back to the presentation for now. So, um, oh man, in my notes I was like, so that looked easy. <laughs> Okay, so I thought I would take a look at how this <laughs> should have worked um, behind the scenes. I, I, I'm always fascinated by looking at you know what is actually happening, what, are the, what is happening in these algorithms behind the scenes. Um, so the way that you do sort of the you know the de facto way of doing object detection or face detection is uh, what's known as the Viola Jones Har cascade. Um, Viola and Jones are the surnames of the two researchers that came up for this method. Um, and this is the, the, the paper that they introduced this technique in. Um, and actually, it's pretty readable. If you are interested in this at all, I, I read the paper as part of the preparation for this talk, and it's not as, you know, I, I kind of assume that it would be like full of formulas and maths. It's, it's actually pretty understandable. Um, but what I'm, I'm going to go over this, let me just see if this, I really want to show you this. Okay. Oh, didn't see anyone. Let's try again. At least it's running now. Uh, where did my mouse go? Okay, let's try again. Everyone smile. Four faces, sweet. Um, you probably can't see that on the camera. Uh, let, me, let me drag this over. There we go. The rest of you don't look human enough. <laughs> Have another cup of coffee or something. Um, so, awesome. I was scared that wasn't gonna work. So, the actual way that this works, let's go back to this. So uh, I just want to point out that this isn't the first way of doing face detection or object detection, this, but this is a very efficient way. Um, and so we're going to see why it's so efficient. So the, the HAR in the, 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 the name comes from this idea of a HAR wavelet. Now, um, the Wikipedia page for this is horrible. It's more calculus symbols than I'm comfortable with. Um, but essentially what a Haar wavelet is, is a very efficient way of specifying a light and a dark area. And that's literally all it is. So if you think of, you know, a light square and a dark square, it's just a way of encoding that very efficiently and being able to, you know, reconstruct that light and dark area very easily. Um, so that is the Haar part of it um, explained. Now the first part of Viola and Jones's paper is a technique they call the integral image, which is a way to test for these light and dark areas within an image very efficiently. And this is actually, I think, the, the most interesting part of the paper because it's kind of very, it, it's fundamentally very simple the, the way that they do it, but it's also a very efficient way. So essentially what they do is they build this integral image beforehand, which is a matrix the same size as the image. So at each you know, point in the image, they have the sum of all the pixels in the origin to that point. And so you can actually very easily work out the average of all those pixels, because you know the area of that square. So you know the number of pixels in that region. And then you know the total, so you just divide by the, the size. Now their insight was that you can extend that to be an arbitrary rectangle in the image because you can subtract the averages of the squares around the square that you're trying to work out. And therefore you can work out the average of any arbitrary square within an image very efficiently. So that was a fun exercise to prove that I knew what was going on here. I actually implemented this. So. There isn't much to see other than it looks like an average of that area, and it's pretty fast. Um, so I guess just to, 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 to reiterate what I just said about how this works, uh, 
to work at the average of this rectangle, they work at the average of this up to the origin, this rectangle, and then by subtracting this rectangle, this rectangle, and this rectangle, being you know the rectangles formed from the other points, you can work out the the average of this, the average of this, and the average of this. Well, this minus all those averages is the average of this arbitrary rectangle. Now we already know that there are Haar wavelets. Um, so a Haar wavelet is a light and dark region. We find the light region, we find the dark region, and we can calculate the average very, very quickly. So essentially what this technique does is means that you can test for a Haar wavelet in a very efficient, I lost myself, very efficient way. Um, and you need to do this because the second part of the technique is um, testing a lot of these wavelets. So this part of the paper is not easy to understand. Um, but basically, to detect for, say, a face, um, you need to detect a lot of these Haar wavelets. And they use an, an artificial intelligence technique called an Ada booster to, de to determine which are the most effective wavelets that specify a, a feature like a face. So this is the this is the graphic from the paper. Uh, so this, for example, you can envisage that your nose might be a lighter area than the area to the sides of it. So this wavelet here might determine that there's a face in this region. And obviously the, the emphasis there is on the word might, because seeing a light region between two dark regions is very unlikely to be a face. And this is where the idea of the cascade comes in. Um, so there are a lot of these, uh, they, they call them filters, which is like a wavelet that if it conforms to the image, might be a face. And what they do is they run the image, or the subsection of the image, through one of these filters, and each filter that it conforms to gives it a higher percentage chance of being a face. But the nice thing is that most places in an image are not going to be a face, so they fall out of the cascade very quickly. So by the time you get through however many wavelets there are, you can be fairly confident that that is you know, a, a conforming area. So the cascade is also a, uh, a way of um, weeding out bad areas in an efficient manner. <coughs> Okay, so let's think about the efficiency of this. So if we have to, we have an, an image and a face could be in any arbitrary subsection of this image. So because we have the integral image, uh, like testing for a single wavelet is essentially an order one operation. Um, and because of the cascade, we can kind of uh, amortize the cost of searching in a subregion to be an order log n operation to find a face. But we, because of the testing in the subregion, we're looking at an order of the number of sub subregions times the log n. So I did some back of an envelope math, and it looks like it's order n log n, but I could be completely wrong there. I'm not a mathematician. But still, that's a pretty good um, performance for something as complicated as looking for a face in uh, an image. And so this is actually really fast. Um, I, um, so if, if you were to say wanting to, to implement this, you would want to use hardware acceleration for as much of this as you can. Um, you would want to use efficient memory allocation. That's what OpenCV has already done. They've implemented this in a, in a very efficient way. Um, they, so one of the, the cool things about OpenCV is if you compile it on a platform that has, uh, you know, hardware acceleration or you know, graphics card, it will it will intelligently use that when it can and fall back to just CPU uh, calculation when it can. So, by using something like OpenCV, you get this algorithm Im implemented very performantly. I mean, Intel know about CPUs, <laughs> so. Uh, question. Mm hmm. Right. So, 
So it's not if a certain number fails. The first one to fail wipes it out as a possibility. So to, you, you can imagine, say you have a, a region that, that might be a face. You, you test number one. If it's just a true, we'll test the next one. But if it's false, immediately we just discard that as a possibility. A single wavelet. Yeah. Right. There's a threshold involved, and that's actually something you can specify when you're doing this uh, the d detection. Um, I I don't actually know. Um, there there you can actually adjust this threshold to be sort of kinder to you know regions. Um, but essentially, so the, the, the technique relies on you have the most generic and best performing wavelets first, and they sort of get more and more precise, which is why, for example, the, the one that I showed you that the nose is a fairly, you know, if there's no nose, there's no person. I don't know. Um, but yes, it's, as, as soon as it sees one that isn't conformant to what they think a face should be, they discard it immediately. Uh, so no second chances, which is probably why. I missed a bunch of you guys in the, the demo. Um, where was I? So yes, yeah, so how fast is this? So because of it, the way that it's implemented, it's actually almost fast enough to use in real time in a video stream. Uh, which, so open, my, my node OpenCV bindings are not fast enough to do that. Um, but if you were to just use the C++ library, for example, um, it is almost fast enough to do I mean, you can basically pass a video in and it will track faces. There are actually other things in OpenCV that will do this better. Though There's actually a motion uh, tracking feature in uh, OpenCV that allows you to say, you see a ball in a video and it will track that ball. Um, but you potentially could do real-time face tracking. Uh, I had a demo, <laughs> when I pitched this talk, I was very optimistic about what I could demo. I, so I have a quadricopter the, using the, the node, uh, quadri node copter bindings. To, uh, and you can actually take the video stream from that, run it through face detection, and um, have it track a face. And I had a demo of this working, but it's incredibly laggy. And then I realized that flying a helicopter above a bunch of people in a talk, I mean, I'm just going to say this is a target-rich environment. Um, <laughs> so I kind of chickened out of that. Um, but basically, you can do some fun stuff with this. Um, and I've only really talked about the face detection one, but there's a lot of really awesome stuff in OpenCV. I mentioned some of these, these things earlier. Um, I would, I've been working on face recognition bindings for a while. Uh, in the new version of OpenCV, there's a way that makes face recognition a whole lot easier than it was before. There's a face recognition class. Um, I would have loved to demo that, but that's actually... Demoing that is really annoying because you have to have such a large data set to do anything useful with it. Um, but that's pretty fun. You can do some creepy stuff with that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of other stuff. Um, I would love to do stuff with the Stereopsis stuff, reconstructing 3D images. Um, I have no idea how, that, that, that's probably pretty slow, but I can envisage, you know, having a helicopter taking pictures as it flies and building up an environment, uh, like a, a represent, representation of the environment it's flying in. Um, that'd be pretty, pretty fun. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of this stuff in OpenZV. Um, and there's also a lot of cutting edge stuff, um, like the, the, Face detection I showed you is dates back to like I think 2001. It's not new at all. There's a lot better stuff out there, um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of really cool new sort of cutting edge stuff um, because OpenCV is so ubiquitous. Um, a lot of you know computer vision researchers use it, and because of this, when they're you know devising new techniques, they often get them into OpenCV very early on, which means that you get to play with some really cutting edge stuff. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Um, so coming back to the, the bindings, I've literally only scraped the surface. I have the face uh, detection, uh, a couple of other very basic stuff, uh, but I just haven't had time to, uh, to uh, you know, really work on doing much more of that. 
Um, so I thought I would beg for help. Um, if anyone is interested in doing this, uh, it's it's pretty fun. And hopefully, if we if we do some live coding, I can show you that it's not that difficult either. Um, yeah, so this is, I guess, the, the purpose of the next part is to prove this statement that they aren't that scary. Um, anyway, so coming to the end of my presentation part of this, at this point, I'd love to take any questions um, on anything I've talked about or just anything, really. So, further. Oh, dear. Right. Um, so the question is how to define a, a classifier for an, a different object, not a face. Yeah. So oh, I broke it. Um, so the paper specifies a way of training these. Uh, these wavelets. So I, I, I only really touched on this, but the Ader booster stuff is the AI technique used to specify which wavelet comes first. Now, that's important because the cascade, the, the efficiency of the cascade relies on you to, to like throwing away non-conformant regions as quickly as possible. So the way that it trains it is to find the, the like to order the, the wavelets by what you know is more deterministic of that, that object. So creating a a, a d detection cascade um, involves using a large number of you know images of whatever you're you're trying to train, and using I don't actually know how it works behind the scenes, but this AI training system picks the wavelets that most accurately uh, define that and orders them in the way that is most efficient. Uh, there is stuff in OpenCV to do this. There isn't. I haven't done that in my bindings. Like you literally have to have the cascade file already. So the one that I showed you there, the, there's a well-known face cascade for the front of your face. There's also ones for sides of the face. There's ones for d detecting eyes, noses, and stuff. Um, yeah, faces are pretty common. But you could theoretically do like cars or, you know, planes or whatever. As far as I know, there is a way to train this, yes. So y if you had a corpus of images, you would be able to um, to train that, yeah. All right, anyone else? Over here. You were showing how the wavelets, you know, these rectangular areas. How does that work when the images rotate at 30 degrees? Um, I don't know. I I think I think you're no longer a face. I think I mean this is a very simple, uh, yeah. So I guess there one one way you could think of it is that it's look, looking for a face and it has to look in all of these subregions. So I didn't really talk about this, but I mean there's also like many scales that your face could be. You could be close to the camera. You could be far away. As part of the sort of iteration through the image, it looks at a larger region, then it divides that into subregions, and it looks at those subregions. Potentially, if you needed this, you could make it also rotate the subregions. Obviously, there'd be a performance hit there. Um, I don't. I don't think it. Does, I think it's very naive at, at the moment. Like, if you rotate, you're not a face anymore. Um, it's actually. I mean, it's not that accurate. You saw that it missed a bunch of people. Um, if you're actually like turning slightly to the side, it doesn't detect you because it's only trained for that that, that front of your face. Um, feature detection is very. It's very basic. It doesn't, I mean, it's a very simplistic technique for doing something like when we recognize a face, there's a lot more goes into it than just that, oh, that looks kind of like a face. We, ha we have a, a knowledge of like what a 3D head looks like, whereas this, this technique is such a, a, a simple technique. Um, in fact, a lot of the time when you're using, you're doing something interesting with face detection, you'll do something like this just as a filter to make the, the, the subsequent steps more performant. You find a lot of likely face regions, and then you can do whatever, maybe face recognition or whatever on that. But you use this as a filter just to find face-like regions. Um, so yeah, this is not, a, a, it's, it has uses, but it, you, you wouldn't be able to just rely on this to be finding all the faces without fail. So is that how we defeat big brothers walking around like this? <laughs> 
<laughs> I, uh, I hope it's that easy. <laughs> um, yeah, These are, this is a pretty easy technique, but I'm pretty sure that Big Brother has better algorithms at this point. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Yeah, so there's a thing in OpenCV called uh, motion tracking. Um, and you define a region in an image, and it will try and track that region around. And it, it's not doing any clever object detection. It's like finding a, like in a subsequent frame, it's finding a similar looking area. Um, and I think it uses some sort of, uh, you know, derivative of that first image to work out how, how likely it is that that image has moved or that region has moved. So what you would do is you would find the face with you know this technique and specify that region and then potentially you know every x number of seconds or whatever you would like refresh looking for the face because the the, the motion tracking is lossy uh, so if the you know your face moves too much or whatever it might be confused and miss that um, I was playing around with that for a while and I was tracking like a bouncing ball uh, and it's pretty good like it it will. It will find the, the motion of the ball, but if it sort of comes towards the camera too fast or changes scale, there's limitations to what it will sort of recognize as the same region. Uh, but yes, there's, there's ways to do that. Um, so it has face detection, like as I showed you. I'm, I'm working on the face recognition. That's kind of, it's, it's, it's a play around library. It's, I've, if you used it for something serious, then you'd probably find a lot of issues. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so face recognition I'm working on. It does have this basic motion tracking stuff that I was talking about. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other things. It's not very fully fledged at the moment. Probably less than one. It's pretty, yeah. OpenCV is huge, yeah. Um, yeah, the Python bindings, I think, are far more complete. They, they, I think they cover, I don't think they're complete, but they, ha they cover a large proportion of that. I, yeah, I'm literally starting to scrape the surface, but not very far. Right. So I've tried to do some node-like stuff. Uh, so for example, I showed you the, the reading from the video stream as a callback. I've actually also allowed you to stream, so using the you know, node streams, stream images, uh, which means you can do things like pipe from the video capture. Um, I guess it's, it's a hard line to draw because the less like OpenCV you make it, the more documentation you have to have justifying that. And like I say, it's kind of a pet project. Um, there is, oh, did I, I didn't repeat the question. Is that what you're waving me? No. Oh, you have a question as well. Sorry, okay. Um, there is, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I mean, it's, it's such a large, OpenCV is such a large library. I think if you don't kind of follow their conventions, you're setting yourself up for a hard task just in terms of you're rethinking a lot of the thought that they've put into why this is structured in a certain way. So for example, like you, you have to orient yourself around the matrix, the basic data, data structure. A lot of the, the operations are based on functions on that matrix. Now one of the things I was actually worried about, I don't know if there's performance implications to adding a number of functions to an object in JavaScript. Does it degrade performance? I don't know that. I just kind of kept going and hoped for the best. But yeah, I, I, I hope that doesn't degrade performance. But that, yeah, there are things like that that whatever environment you translate it into, I guess there are trade-offs there. Um, yeah. I haven't got that much of a philosophy on it. If you don't like what I'm doing, tell me. Uh, give me a pull request. Uh, had a question. 
Yeah, I, I do need a root beer. Yeah. I was just going to ask, a while ago, a couple of years ago, I was So I did see something similar to that. Um, I'm, I think there is another OpenCV binding that were created with that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the status of that is. Um, it would be very interesting to like have that as sort of the basis and then extend on top of that. I think you would still want to sort of manually like you know create helpers because a lot of this stuff is so C plus plus like. It would be weird to not have some sort of translation. Um, I mean, the other thing is that, so with the extension, you're, you're wrapping with a, like a wrapping object. I don't know how you would auto-generate that. There's probably a way. I, yeah. No, I don't know anything about that. Anyone else? Yeah. How easy is it to like bundle up uh, what you've done with, uh, to make a kind of portable JavaScript OpenCV application? Is there several problems so, you just hit on why the next part of this live demonstration is going to be hard, is that building OpenCV is complete pain. Um, if you have it on your laptop already, building Open, uh, Node OpenCV with it is very easy, but I don't bundle OpenCV, the library, with it just because it's so difficult to build. Um, we're, I, yeah, let's try and build it. If, yeah, that's, it's an, it's an interesting, I've built, OpenCV maybe like 25 times now as part of developing this, and every time I tear my hair out. Um, it has requirements on FFmpeg, which itself is hard to build. Uh, all of the, you know, libpng, libjpeg, all of that. Um, trying to avoid maybe building on a Mac or something. So I have had, I, I do know people that have had success with Mac ports. Um, personally, I haven't. Uh, it always seems to yeah, there always seems to be some inconsistency there. T tell me how it goes. Uh, okay. yeah. I think half the issues I have on my bindings right now are people that haven't been able to build OpenCV, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, your library has to be built on top of the OpenCV. So, yeah, the, the way it works is OpenCV is just built as a, you know, a, a, a library that can be you know, compiled against. Uh, and then the, the, the actual node bindings are a, they're more C++. Uh, files, but when you compile that, um, so you compile node bindings with a tool called uh, GYP, um, and that uses you know C flags to work out how to link against uh, OpenCV. I kind of just assume you have it somewhere. If it, you don't, the build just fails. Um, but yeah, that does all the linking and uh, and whatever there. Yeah, if you guys want to start trying to install OpenCV, I'm happy to sort of help you out here. Um, I guess let's transition into the, the interactive portion of this. Um, I mean, do you guys have Node and stuff on your laptops already? Or good, okay. Um, yeah. So how's your install going? <laughs> yeah. Um, anyone have any questions in the meantime? I have a kind of basic general Node question. <coughs> you, you pick Node just because you like, you, that's what you like working with and it's uh, Essentially, yeah. How does that affect the usefulness of it in terms of like how would you deploy this for your camera, quadcopter, demo, whatever? So the, what type of environment? the, the Node copter stuff, the interesting thing about that is it all runs locally. You're not running anything on the quadcopter. Um, the quadricopter is like the, the one that everyone uses, the Parrot AR drone, and that has essentially it streams data in this proprietary format that they've kind of reverse engineered um, over a local Wi-Fi network. Um, so essentially, what you're doing is you're connecting to that Wi-Fi network, and there is this this node library to um, decode that, that that format or whatever. And as part of that, it, it has a video stream. Um, 
it's actually the, one of the reasons why it's so unperformant and you, you can't do stuff like uh, real-time face detection on the, the quadcopter, or at least you can, but very slowly, is the fact that to get the video stream, the video stream comes in this weird format, and the, the NodeCopter library uses FFmpeg to decode that to a, a, a PNG. Um, and then to do any like, uh, OpenCV processing on it, you load that PNG in as the OpenCV matrix. That entire process just adds too much latency to really do anything in real time. Um, I did. Have, I had someone uh, who had they had the quadricopter fall in the face, but it was literally you moved your face and then a couple of seconds later it would rotate around. It made it a lot more creepy because of the lag. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about Node in general as well, if you guys have questions. So um, I guess uh, if you guys want, like, want to play around with this install, or I guess uh, the other thing that I was thinking I could do is I could sort of go through how I would code another you know, binding in OpenCV. This one's a little bit more daunting because I have to code in front of you, and that's embarrassing. Um, all right, I guess I'll... I guess I'm interested in general, can you talk a little loud as you do that through your process of like, just your development workflow doing native uh, I can, yeah. This is probably a don't do as I say thing though because I'm very much a sort of experimental... Let me mirror my display, of course. Um, Sorry, let me give it a setup. Um, yeah, I don't think I have a very good process. I uh, I just like playing around. Um, where's the display? Can everyone read that? Okay, so uh, oh, I'm already in a branch. So these are the things I'm kind of working on in progress. Um, so, for example, you were talking about generic, um, generic object detection and how you would train that. That's the provide cascades branch. I don't know how I was doing that. Yeah, these are all sort of half-started thoughts. This is why I, I, I would say don't do as I do. I start a lot of things, I finish very few. Um, so yeah. Um, so I guess in this thresholds branch I was looking at, there's a, a way that you can sort of uh, apply this filter. I'll, I don't remember what I was doing here. Okay, so there's a threshold uh, function that allows you to specify a... It basically finds regions in the image that are above a certain threshold, and this is nice for, you know, like cleaning noise from background data or whatever. Um, so, I guess... Do I have an example that I can run this on? Uh... thresholds. <coughs> so I guess my process for, for, for adding something is I usually just copy paste an existing thing that's similar. Um, C++ is so verbose that I think that writing anything from scratch is uh, it's cleverer than I am. Um, so I just kind of find something similar. Um, at this point there's enough sort of functionality in there that I can usually find something that's doing something similar enough. Um, Part of the reason that developing these bindings is sort of um, interesting is the, the fact that V8 extensions, I'll, I'll show you some code because it's worth seeing 
some of the things, some of the hoops the VA makes you jump through. Um, so let's look at the look at the matrix again. Um, so for example, so this threshold that I just added in, this threshold function, which I should really show you working actually. Uh, I have a smoke test. I think should we'll run this. Oh, I've got to do this. So, so I have a script that uh, runs this smoke test and actually rebuilds the library. Um, so that's what I'm doing now because obviously I've screwed up with my note version or something. Um, so I'll show you that build script actually. Um, did you get, have any luck getting this to build? No, it's going to take a while. Oh, it's going to take a while, okay. This didn't work. Use. Okay. So I guess you what you can take from my uh, process is that it's not good. Okay. So they're running now. Okay. Sweet. For some reason, running shell scripts from Vim hasn't got the right node version set up. So, um, so I guess I'll show you my, my, my build uh, script and walk you through that. So basically what I do is, so to build the extensions, I mean, if you were to just wanting to install these, you just use npm install, but behind the scenes what that's doing is using node GYP uh, to build the extensions. This is actually what does the compilation and links it against um, OpenCV. So let's look at, so this uses a JIP file. Um, so you were asking earlier about how it linked against uh, OpenCV. So it's actually literally just using package config to find OpenCV on your system. And if it's there, it links against it. Um, so this is why it might not work with uh, Homebrew. <laughs> I think this part of it is actually pretty good. It's the actual OpenCV library that most people fail to install. Um, but basically that's what happens there and then I'm running the actual smoke test. So let's look at the smoke test here. Uh, yeah, this is another example of my scattered mind. So, okay, so we're actually, when I ran those tests, we were actually running this thresholds function. So let's open um, So this is what the threshold does to the image. Um, so I guess you can just see what parts are sort of saturated in each channel. Um, so that's what I was doing. So let's look at that code again. Oh, sorry. I think what I did is I ran that on each channel separately. And I'll let's take a look at this code. So OK, so, so the, the terminology here, channels are you know, like what, if it's a, a, an RGB image, for example, the way that, that OpenCV works is that, well, I talked about the matrix and how, it, you know, there's width and height, and then each point there is a, um, you know, depending whether it's grayscale or whatever. It's actually, so you, you specify a data type in OpenCV. Um, so this could actually be, like, like you say, like a, a vector of RGB or HSL or whatever. Um, and there's sort of standard ways of doing that. So most of the, 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 the functions you actually just run on a single channel. Um, so you, what you want to do is convert to grayscale beforehand using whatever you know conversion you want. Um, so I actually don't know why that ran on three channels. Let me let me look at this. Um, I guess yeah. I guess it just works on three channels. Let's look at. Yeah, because I guess I'm not converting to grayscale. There is there is one where I am. Uh, 
So yeah, for example, you would do something like convert color, uh, and then this this specifies the the way you convert to the, the grayscale. So if we just copy this and add this to the, the the threshold code, let's just try this and see what happens. Um, uh, where am I actually performing this thing? Okay, so let's perform it on itself. Okay, let's see if this builds. It probably won't. Okay, so it ran, and the unit test passed. There you go. So that's what it would look like on a single channel, um, which is a little bit more useful probably. I don't know why you would ever want to do that on three channels, but um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, where did I go? Where is my terminal? Here we go. So that would be, uh, so I, I guess that was a nice example of how easy it is to literally change what this native code is doing. Um, let's get rid of all that, oh dear. So I guess the next uh, thing that we could do is actually add uh, uh, a function to it. So let's look at um, um, let's look at OpenCV uh, docs. Um, we'll find like a nice function that will be easy to implement because um, there's plenty of them that I haven't. <laughs> Um, this is the research paper, by the way. I have it open. So yeah, it's only nine pages, and I didn't have much difficulty following it, which is unusual. So I would say that that's pretty fun if you're if you're interested in this stuff, just to get an idea of how this stuff happens. That was that was pretty fun. Okay, so it looks like there isn't any of the CV ducks. So what I usually do is find, I usually look for something that I was, I'd be interested in. Where's the, the threshold stuff? I guess that isn't in here. Let's, let's search for the threshold stuff. See if there's something similar to that that we can do. If you guys have a special request or anything, I'm happy to, if, you, if you're particularly interested in a certain aspect of something. So I think what I was doing before is this threshold. Oh no, this is Python. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So yeah. This is, so like you say, I should have converted it to grayscale beforehand. That's what they're doing there. Um, so this just looks like it is a basic one. Okay, so let's, in, let's implement the, seems like this is an inverted one that we can do. Uh, 
So Yeah, so I guess they have this threshold type that we can pass through and that could be pretty interesting. So what is the threshold type? Oh, well, that's helpful. Three. It's obvious. Let's let's pass that through anyway and see what happens. Um, so, well, CV threshold. Okay, so I'm using the threshold binary right now, but I guess we could pass that through. Uh, let's do what we call it type. That's a really bad name. Whatever. So let's say int type equals, what did I have it before? CV. Uh, so you can see how scattered my process is here. Can't even work Vim. What did I change it from? What's going on? Where's my git diff? This is what I want. Uh, okay, so that is the basic case, but let's say that we want to, if they pass in an extra argument, so what one of the things we can do is, so this argument is a wrapper around a JavaScript array, which obviously can be an arbitrary length. So, for example, when you construct a, a matrix, I look at the length, so what I'm going to do is just copy-paste that, <laughs> that code. Um, so, yeah, length is just a method on this data structure here. So, we already have definitely two arguments, but I guess if you pass in a third, uh, is three type equals args three and then you do this number value which casts it as a well that casts as a, a double I want to actually do integer value I think that's a function you kind of have to do a lot of sort of casting because the you know, being a, a very dynamic language, uh, JavaScript will let you do whatever you want. You can have a, a number that isn't an integer or an integer that isn't a number, whatever. So there's a lot of sort of assumptions that I'm making here. Let's see if that works. Uh, what did I... Uh, your, sorry, what, what, what was that? Sorry, I, I misunderstand. Yes. Yes. So, our, so the the first argument is this threshold that we pass in. So, let's. I'll show you how we're actually using this code. Uh, oh, ten fourteen. What am I doing? Oh, you're totally right. Sorry, I'm. Uh, you're absolutely right. I. Uh, off by one. So what we want to do here is specify, what, what were the one they were using? Three? I have no idea what number three does, but let's try it anyway. Okay, let's see if this works. I'm glad he didn't plug the audio in because otherwise you'd hear how many times the, the bell goes because I've mistyped something. Okay, so let's see let's uh, let's see what that looks like now. Oh, so that didn't do anything. That's useless. You definitely put three in here, right? Threshold type, one of the five thresholding operations. So zero is binary, one is binary inverted. Threshold to zero. Let's try binary inverted. So the nice thing about this is because it's compiled, I don't have to run everything again. I can just... 
So this is why dynamic languages are awesome. There we go. Which looks hideous. Um, so this is cool, but I think it would be pretty terrible practice to leave these as magic numbers. So, what am I going to do? I guess we could try and pass them in as strings. Let's do that. Uh, actually, I have no idea how you compare JavaScript strings and C. So usually what I do when I, I'm trying to code something is I just Google it and see if someone else has done that already. So I do have like sort of some JavaScript stuff on top, but I, I just basically keep as much as I can in the C++ stuff. Um, because basically if you want to do the, the JavaScript stuff, you have to sort of redefine the function and then call the C++ function. Um, so I'll show you that actually, that's pretty interesting. So for example, like the streaming stuff um, is all, um, right here? Right. So that's kind of what I was hoping to go towards. So I'll show you like so the video stream stuff, for example. I'm essentially, you know, creating this um, event emitter or whatever on top of the the uh, video capture. Like so, CV video capture is you know the the V8 stuff, but then this video stream is JavaScript. So I'm trying to make it a little bit more idiomatic there. Um, but in terms of stuff like you know, adding something to a, the threshold function. I don't want to have to override the threshold function specifically just to add this. I don't know. I, I could be doing it wrong. I, I don't know whether there's advantages either way there. Um, it would be probably easier to write that code. I wouldn't have to Google compare strings in V8. Right. Um, <laughs> so this is the documentation you work with when you're when you're uh, working with Hmm, where are we? I thought there'd be a comparison function somewhere. All right, I guess not. So I guess we'll convert it to an ASCII value and then compare them. V8 is interesting. I think that's probably the most complimentary way of putting it. Um, there are inconsistencies that will make you tear your hair out. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a compare function. All right, okay, so let's try this. Let's say that you do, um, Do I have a string value? Hmm. Oh, I, I must be passing a string when I save it. So let's look at the save function. Okay, so what I do is I string ASCII value of the file name here. So what I want to do here is I want to Okay, and then I want, oh, this is type. I don't, naming things is also hard. S -s type string, I don't know, that'll do. And then we want to compare it to I don't even know what I'm doing here anymore. What were the thresholding things? Binary, binary inverted. Let's just do this really ugly. Say if type 
So what do you do? You do like string compare and see, right? This is the level of competence I have. Yeah, shit. I mean, okay. String compare. All right. So it seems like, I do you guys know C++ because you're probably like thinking that I'm completely stupid right now. Uh, uh, yeah. So I just pass in a string address, but can I do that with a constant? So it's string object one dot compare string object two. Right. Can I can I pass in a constant here though? All right, no, no. Let's try this. Yeah, I think you're right. So let's say just type. No, there's no e there. Dot compare. But then can I do like something like that? Do you think? I guess we'll find out pretty quickly. Yeah. So is it binary? Let's do binary. Is it zero? All right. And then binary inverted. Oh, equal, yeah, you're right. Well, I can hard to try this. Um, so let's work this out. Smoke test. Binary. Moment of truth. Oh, no. No member name compare. Oh, because it's an ASCII value. So that's not a string. Oh, caps lock. So in save, I must be doing something here. I guess, can I just take a pointer to it to make it a string? So I guess this is a V8 string. How do I make this into a C++ string? If in doubt, make a pointer. Nope. So I need to wait, make a string into, I'm pretty sure I've hit this problem before. How do I? Yeah, see here, I'm just dereferencing it. And that seems to work with OpenCV. Oh, but that's just making it into like raw ASCII. How do you make a string in C++? Man, I'm really showing off my ignorance here. Yeah? 
like stir stir comb like that CMP Oh, I'm in the wrong place anyway. I'm excited as well. <laughs> that looks a lot nicer anyway. The return value is similar to the Oh, yeah. Gosh. Worth a try. Oh, I spelt it wrong. No vowels in C. It's a rule. Okay. No function. We're in a different world. Yeah. I don't think so. Let's try that. Uh, <laughs> let's convert this into C. So, uh, was it string dot? <laughs> Is it one of these ones? Well, it is angle. String dot H. Yeah. Okay, let's try this. There's still no stircomp. Oh, is this one of these things where you need to do using string? Using. St STD string? No, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, just... Like that? This is probably horrific for you, but <laughs> I'm learning something. Semicolon. Oh, nice. Okay. This is like reverse training. You're all teaching me. I like it. Um, oh dear, it's still. Oh, so it's just my bad? Yeah. Okay. So if I get rid of all this, it's basically my fault for down here doing something stupid. Do I need to put a pointer here? Maybe. Do you reference that? Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see if it worked. That's plausible. <laughs> let's try binary inverted. See if that looks good. Uh, yeah, we got it. So what were the other ones? There were some other cool ones in here. Threshold truncated, threshold to zero. Uh, where are we? I have no shame in just copying and pasting stuff.
Um, so Facebook bought Face.com, which I think was some proprietary extensions around OpenTV. Um, so I would be, yeah, I'd be shocked if not, just because there is enough in there. They probably have a lot of other stuff on top of it, but yeah, I, I actually don't know what the state of proprietary computer vision libraries are. I, they probably would use some of that as well. Um, but uh, like I say, this is a pretty ubiquitous library. Um, The face.com one was like maybe two years ago? No, maybe last year. I don't know. Um, I, I thought that was a pretty creepy acquisition of theirs. Because now Facebook basically have a database of my face and a direct line to the NSA. Um, Sweet. Okay, so let's let's test test this one. One of the cooler ones. What's what's this last one called? Threshold to zero inverted. Let's see what that one does. Oh. That one's pretty boring. <laughs> Let's try with a different threshold. <clears throat> there we go. Made her alien. Mm -hmm. All right, so we did some good work here. Let's push it live. You know what? I'm going to merge it. I'm going to publish this. We're going to be going live during the session. Did anyone manage to install this? Because then if you could use this during the session, I think that would be a home run. I found it. I got things installed, but uh, it's not running. They're not running? What, what, what are you getting there? The uh, face recognizer object doesn't exist. Fa face recognizer object? Oh, man. OK, so you could probably have, you know what version of OpenCV you have? This should be hidden behind a. So that should work. It should be hidden behind a. Um, it should be testing what version you have because the face recognizer stuff is only in the new one. That's probably like a real bug. Okay. Um, crap. Let's live debug that in a second. Um, but we're putting the threshold stuff in live. Let's do this. Oh wait a second. Let's bump the version. There you go, you can get this stuff live. Yeah, I think I have 2.4 on my laptop, but 2.3 I should support. Is it during, like, during when you compile or when you npm install? Did you npm install or did you clone the repo? I clone the repo. Okay. Smoke does a SH, so it builds. It builds, and then the JS fails. Oh, interesting. Oh, you know, I'm probably doing like face recognition in the smoke test. Yeah, the smoke test is like just, honestly, I call it a smoke test, but it's really just like my scattered mind.js. Like I just, whatever I do, I do in there. Um, Um, so actually I just pushed this and I think in this, my smoke test is, oh dear. So if you pull, I, I think the stuff that I just did with the threshold is going to be up there in a second. Uh, once I, oh dear, oh dear. 
Merge conflicts. I'll just check out the threshold branch. Yeah, I'll let's just add these. Yeah. Oh, did I uh, did I push this in the threshold? Yeah. I think. See if this builds before I push it. Sweet. Oh dear, I missed one. Oh no, what's this mean? Bad merge. There we go. So if I can like release a function in a talk live, you guys could at least, you know, add a couple like in the next couple of sessions. I don't know. Uh, look at this. Clean test run. Sweet. The reason that the tests run is because I have not run any tests. So. Uh, I should probably republish this as well now. So did anyone else get it running? I'm halfway through dependencies. <laughs> halfway through dependencies? Yes. I'm, if you get OpenCV working, I'm impressed. I have spent too much of my life building OpenCV. I cheated. You? Oh, nice. <laughs> Pink. Uh, oh, So I have, uh, I know some guys, do you, have you guys heard of the Docker project? Basically, it's like a, a wrapper around Linux containers. So you can run these superweight Linux containers. And I went to this meetup and I was, you know, complaining about how hard it is to build OpenCV. And he built a container with OpenCV built within it. So theoretically, if you have Docker, which only builds on 64-bit Linuxes, so that's your situation, then you can literally download this image and run stuff in there, which saves all the building stuff. It's pretty nice. It's called Docker. Docker, yeah. It's a pretty cool project. All right, so this is published, I think. So now, you should be able to do this live. Let's check out GitHub. All right, version 0 0.3. Does anyone have any sort of questions or criticisms or, I don't know, um, requests? I have a bunch, of, a bunch of the issues here are just with OpenCV, so I need to sort of solidify the story. There is a way with GYP to include um, the build step for you know, other libraries in there. 
I, I would love to do it, but I'm just kind of daunted at the idea of having all of OpenCV's build within that. That seems like a pretty terrifying prospect. Um, but that would be really cool, because then you could just npm install it, and you wouldn't have to build OpenCV as well. Um, oh, this is the Docker file I, that I told you about. So this, theoretically, is the, the steps to get it running on Ubuntu 12.4, which doesn't look that bad, actually. Yeah, nice. Um, what's the time? 11.30. We have 15 minutes if anyone wants to make any requests of more features, more live coding. I'm, I'm there to learn some more C++, so... See if I have any cool demos. I haven't. No. What? What? What do they do? Okay. Okay. So one of the nice things about OpenZV is it does like when you install. Install. One of the reasons the build is so complicated is it does a lot of these detections for you know compliant GPUs or whatever, and it will offload as much of the the processing there as it can. So theoretically, like you know, I may already already be doing that. Uh, depending on how you build OpenZV, I guess if there's a lot of floating point operations in whatever you're doing, that probably already offloads it to the GPU. Um, that's yeah. That one of the reasons that OpenCV is great over say you know writing your own thing is. Because they have this expertise in, you know, in Intel, uh, a lot of this stuff is designed in a way that they can offload it onto the GPU for you. So it's, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I was going to see what examples I have. I think they did, yeah. I've, I've definitely seen a picture of that car uh, related to this. Yeah, which is a really cool use case. I mean, I think anytime you add a robot to something, yeah. it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, there was a shape that detection one. Or where am I looking? Yeah, let's look at detect shapes. So this is using the, I actually don't think I wrote this, I think someone else did, which is cool. Approx poly, I don't know what that means, but. I, oh, this, I think this is just to, like, this is like a, using the canny uh, dilation to uh, outline uh, shapes. So if we run this, so, uh, so that basically is a, a filter that I'll, I'll show you the app, but it's more easy to see than to explain. Um, so let's actually run this, see if it works. Uh, oh, there we go. So it has put no, actually, I don't know what went on there. Wow, that's cool. Uh, so, what is it doing? So it's opening shapes.jpg, converting to grace, using the canny. So canny is just a, a way of, you know, finding edge detection. Um, and then it's dilating, and then it's finding the contours. Oh, uh, okay, so it's like drawing along the contours. That's pretty cool. So let, what, let's open the shapes. Well, that's cool. So it's turning that into this. I don't know why it turned around, but... Yeah, I didn't make this. Someone else did. That's awesome. Sweet. What else have we got? Oh, someone was asking about motion tracking. 
I don't know that this actually works, but let's take a look. So yeah, so you, you uh, specify where in the image you want to have a tracked object, and it should, this is just going to log out where it goes. So let's open, it's my test file. Yeah, I think I was like pushing a coin around. Yeah. So let's see if this works. Sadly, I haven't got a way of the, there is a, uh, a thing for writing back out to a video so I could outline it in the video, but I haven't got that working yet. So this is literally going to print out where the, uh, Oh, I need to specify motion. Okay, I guess this one doesn't work. No, I don't know what's going on. Track. Oh, you know what? It's because this has... Yeah, I'm, I don't know what's going on there. Let's see what other examples there are. Yeah, I don't know that many of these other ones will work. <laughs> um, you have a question? Yeah, in, uh, Google Hangout, do you use that much? Yeah, but you add the, uh, the, 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 the things. Yeah. I have, yeah, I've done similar things. You can definitely, so you can do this with static images. With the live video stream, I think it's a little bit too slow. You get too much lag. Actually, what's really interesting about Google Hangouts, I don't know how they're doing it now, but there is something in the new, um, in the new HTML, uh, what do they call it, user media stream or whatever, there is something that I think is built into the standard where you can do object detection. So you're actually doing this within the browser. I don't know the details of this, but I've seen someone do a really cool proof of concept. Um, actually, people have implemented uh, the same algorithm in just raw JavaScript, which is really impressive. Um, I don't know where that is. Let's try to find that because the can I remember what the the video capture stuff in new HTML? You can get user media. Yeah, her stuff is really cool. Um, she uses actually like a neural network. Um, so it's like training, so it's like the cat detection, right? right? Which is really cool, but I think that is using a neural network and training that on, on so cats. It's a neural network for the classifiers, but I'm not sure how she's processing it. I don't know if it's a matrix based or some other type of representation of the images. Okay, yeah. I, Oh, here we go. Yeah, I think this is, well, someone has done this. I look pretty good. Okay. Let's see how they did this.
Oh, it's probably somewhere in here. Okay, so there's something called ccv.js, which I think does this stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know where the actual detection stuff is, but yeah, it looks like this person has done this all in JavaScript, which is pretty rad. Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about that, but that's pretty sweet. That actually looked really fast as well. I don't know how they made it so performant. I'll have to look into this. Sweet. All right, I went 11.41. Is, does anyone have any last questions? I guess I should probably wrap this up. Um, yeah, that was fun. Thanks for coming. I will, yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, around for the rest of the conference. Yeah, if you want to hack, I'm, I'm down. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>